Hey, I'm Jeff from Home Renovision. Welcome to our YouTube channel, which is designed specifically for the DIY homeowner in mind to teach you how to do things around the house and get professional results. Today, we are tackling framing. That's right, in this particular case, we're building a shed, but all the techniques and information we're gonna use here is also good for framing basements. So stay with us because we're on a concrete pad and it doesn't matter whether you're outdoors or in the hole, it's all the same thing. When you're framing on a concrete slab, you need two different kinds of wood. One is you need regular spruce lumber, and the other one is you need pressure treated, okay? And the reason you want pressure treated lumber is because the building code allows for you to use this as your bottom plate in direct contact with concrete so that it won't suck up the moisture through the concrete and into your wall. When you build like this, you actually have a moisture barrier between your concrete and your spruce so that the mold that's naturally occurring in wood cannot grow. This is very important because whether you're outside on a concrete pad like we are, or you're framing in your basement, it's the same science. And if you build like we're gonna show you today, you'll be able to frame anything in your house. So one of the things we like to do on our channel is show you techniques and tips and tricks that involve basic tools because most homeowners or do-it-yourselfers don't have an array of tools to work with. So for instance, in a lot of framing videos, you'll see people working with the uh, automatic nailing guns and those are great. And if you got one, by all means, help yourself. It'll speed things up a little bit. But the reality is they're running around $400. And if you don't have a good compressor or you don't have an extra $400 to put into the cost of building just a shed, you don't wanna go and buy one of those things. So we're gonna show you techniques, basic drill and screws. And we're also gonna show you how to use a hammer and nails. I know it's a little old school, but the fact is, is it's about the same speed. So whatever you're more comfortable using, we're gonna show you how to do both. But before we get started, let's just think, you wanna have the design of your shed. Now, typically I've seen all kinds of sheds they are built like barns. All the walls are the same size, they have gable ends and they've got a peak roof like this. But the reality is that's a lot of work to build a shed with that kind of roof design. So what we're gonna do is a little bit different. So I'm gonna give you an idea of what's gonna happen. Let's say from this post to this post is the side of our shed. And this is about an eight foot tall. We're gonna build it with the wall on the back side of the shed at seven feet and the wall at the front at eight feet. So we have a slope that'll facilitate our removing of the water to the back side of the shed, but it also makes it really easy to build and you only have to build one slope for the roof. This is why I'm gonna show you this technique today because building a shed doesn't have to be a work of art, it has to be functional. And the first rule of design is make sure it functions. There's no need to make all kinds of extra work and all kinds of extra design elements in building a shed with two different slopes on the roof. So by doing one slope, we can actually save a lot of money because we don't have gable ends that we have to use extra materials and throw in the garbage. And that'll save you time and money and it'll give you a great look. So we're gonna finish this off with a nice little pressure treated one by five running around the edge of the roof. You aren't gonna see any roofing. It's gonna be sleek, it's gonna be sexy, it's gonna function, it's gonna be cheap, it's gonna be quick. Stay with us. So we've just cut our boards. We've got our layout here. We've got two by fours, pressure treated 10 foot long. And then these ones we've cut back so that our total exterior is seven feet. The reason we're doing that is our design element actually takes into place, our roof is gonna extend out to the front edge of the slab, have a couple of posts to pick up the weight, and you also have a sitting area out front as well. And I'm sure the dog will appreciate having a nice cool shaded area to sit all day long. Our elements here are basically simple. We're gonna have a door in the middle, we're gonna have a window on each side, and we're gonna have a cheater door back here that swings open, you can bring the lawnmower in from the back side. The reason we're doing that is because if you can bring the lawnmower in up against an outside wall, you're gonna actually save a ton of space. Having to bring your lawnmower in through the main door makes everything dirty all the time, and it keeps you from having a clean shed because you need room for removing it around, or it's just always in the way. So we're gonna have a little cheat door here. It'd be almost like a hidden door with a little side ramp. We're gonna build that separately. But let's get back to framing. We need to lay out. You need to understand what it is you're gonna build. So the way you lay it out is simple. Basically, it's all about visualization. For us, we don't have a plan we're working off. It's all coming out of here. So we're gonna go with our 10 foot by our seven foot. That is simple. And we are going to just cut our plate, put it in place, get an idea. Am I gonna be happy with that? 
is that is that big enough is it small enough once you got all those questions done then you're ready to start because this framing here this plate this is the first step that you need next step you do is you make the same frame for the top of the walls and you just get all those cut and laid out as well so in our effort to try to keep things really simple if you have a skill saw I'm going to show you a way that you can actually cut all your framing lumber and then you don't need to set up a chop saw you just take your measurement put your mark on the wood get your little square here or triangle as I call it because it kind of looks like a triangle anyway on your saw you're going to have a line where it marks zero where the blade cuts and you want to set that up on your pencil mark and then move the triangle right up to the to the guide right up to the guard and I'm going to use this squeezing it against the frame to be my cutting guide so I cut straight through the wood now that gets you a perfectly square cut nothing ever binds nothing's ever on an angle and everything is always perfect because you're not freehand cutting so that's a great technique and if you don't have a chop saw and you want to build a shed or you want to frame your basement you can use that technique it only takes a couple seconds to cut and honestly it'll save you a few hundred dollars we have the foundation for our building today we have all of our walls top and bottom plate and now it's just a matter of constructing each individual wall so we'll take our pieces and we'll set them aside for now so we have room to build on our pad and then lift everything in place as we go now it's very important that when you're framing your wall you know how to mark it up and it's easier because we're using pressure treated for the bottom and regular lumber for the top otherwise you should mark it bottom and top just so you don't get confused especially if you're going to be putting doors or windows in basically what you do is get them flush at the end you run your tape across it for anybody who doesn't have an understanding of building materials this is where you really need to understand um, the building technique that we use is so that it accommodates the materials that we're going to be installing to finish so right here is our 48 inches and this is really important because if our lumber is an inch and a half thick then that would represent the full thickness of a piece of wood this is marked to the middle now when we put on our sheet good it's four feet long we want to have it finish in the middle of a stud so we can nail it put on the next piece and have a nailing surface for that one as well so when you're marking this we're going to go four feet on center so it's every 16 inches on center so all of these are going to be on red squares okay so you can actually mark the center of all of your sticks top and bottom where all these little red squares are okay and that'll help make sure that things go well now professional framers would frame it this way they'd go like this okay mark three quarters over and they'll put an X where the wood is they'll actually mark the side of the board now either one of those techniques works fine as long as you have a system that you're using make sure that you can finish with the center of the wood on the red square that is really the whole secret buying a good tape measure so that you're able to understand what you're doing without having to do the math as you go along okay and of course the end of every wall gets a stick as well that's without saying and now this is the center mark I'm using two different systems here just to demonstrate if you're marking a center put the little C on so you remember okay that's the center line now all we have to do is add up how many pieces we have and remember our back wall is going to be seven feet at finish so we have to take our seven foot measurement minus the bottom plate and a top plate and a second top plate and the reason we use two top plates is because when I stand this wall up you'll see the frames are 16 inches apart there's a lot of weight coming from the roof and on this top plate and if you don't line up all of your rafters of your roof on these studs exactly then the transfer is going to be in between them and then these will start to bow things will start to come apart and look messy by doubling up the top plate you add enough strength to transfer that load over to the sticks so when you build your roof you don't have to worry about being perfectly in line with your wall framing because that'll drive you crazy the total height of the wall is going to be seven feet which is 84 inches minus three pieces of lumber okay and they're an inch and a half each that makes it four and a half so one two three four and a half makes it 79 and a half inches and that's how long our studs are going to be so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark down 79 and a half 
on my lumber so I don't forget. And the number of pieces at that length that I need. So now I can come over to my pile and I can make all my marks and I'm not ever gonna forget what my measurement is. Now I'm gonna be using a black marker to make all my marks today just so that it shows up better on the camera. On a bright sunny day like today, it can be really hard to see a pencil mark. So you can see how efficient this is, just having the saw right next to your lumber pile. Pull the square up, grab the saw, line it up, squeeze. Grab the next one. Just remember, anytime you're cutting your lumber like this, anything that's less than 15 or 16 inches, keep it in a separate pile. They'll come real handy later when you're building, you're stabilizing for your walls, or you're doing little work on the rafters or the sidewall. This kind of stuff is like gold, so keep it organized, and don't start getting too ahead of yourself and throwing it all out. So you can see I've got my nine pieces of wood basically laid out in the location that they're gonna go. And all you have to do here is take your top plate, walk it to the other side and then start nailing everything together and just remember that with dimensional lumber every two inches that of the dimensional lumber gets one screw or one nail so two by four is two if you're building your shed with two by six for some weird reason you want to have it incredibly strong then make sure you're using three fasteners two just won't be enough to keep the studs from twisting over time. All right, so if you've got the center marked, line it up in the center of the wood. And like I said, there's two ways to do this. You can screw it or you can nail it. If you're gonna use a hammer and nails, I would suggest that you stand on both pieces of wood. All right, and if you're not used to this, wear steel toe boots in case you miss. I have also seen, oh, I've also seen a lot of people where they'll, they'll sit here and hold the wood in place and they'll swing the hammer like this. Just remember, if you miss, think about what you're gonna be hitting. This is a pretty fast technique if you're comfortable with it. And if you're not, just use the screws. So here's a little tip for you. When you're working with the screw gun, one of the benefits is if you have a piece of wood that's twisted, you can line up the bottom, okay, screw it in, and then you can use this claw that's on the back of the framing hammer. Now not every hammer has this, so I like this hammer for this reason. This little claw here actually gives you the ability to grab the wood and twist it. And force it into place, either direction, okay? And if it's twisted, just push a little bit past where it's perfect, driving your screw, and then when you're done, it'll keep your wood nice and straight. All right, well, now that we've got our wall done, we're ready to finish it. <laughs> what we wanna do before we go stand it up into place is actually get the outside skin on. Uh, the reason for that is because the board it's a typical kind of exterior board for sheds. It comes pre-primed. So this is the exterior panel. It's basically designed to look like wood, but it's more of a pressed board. Um, you can take a look at the back there. It's just a chipboard. And the front of it has been manufactured to look like it's all kind of beautiful wood paneling. There's our 48 inch line. That's the middle of that stud. And so what happens is you put the first one on flush at the corner. You can nail all the way up the side of this one and it's tongue and groove, so it's actually it's more like a shiplock over overlap. So the other, the next piece will actually go overlap this and come up to this little raised bump right to here. And it'll also have a nailing surface on that same stud because we set this middle of the stud at the 48 inch, which is right there. So this is we're gonna work out perfect. This is why 
if you understand your building materials and how they're installed, and you just follow the framing technique of keep everything on center, 48, you're going to be just fine. Now, these sheets are eight feet tall, so it's more than what we need, so we're going to go cut it off. Easiest way to do this is just lay it on your wall, grab your level, line it up with the top plate, okay, and make a mark about one inch higher, because don't forget we're going to use a second top plate. In this case, I'm just following my shadow because that'll work out well. <laughs> I'm going to cut here. When you're thinking about your finished cuts for your exterior wallboard, you need to have your entire design plan figured out. We're going to go very New England style here. So we're going to use pieces of one by three trim at the corners of the bottom and the top just to close everything off to get a nice finished look. So I know I don't have to have my cuts perfect. I just have to have them close and let all the trims do the rest of the work. When you're cutting something thin, Adjust the depth of your blade, okay, to something thinner. That'll help you keep your blade from overheating and from going warped on you. Get my zero on the mark, and I'm going to just follow along, and I'm going to keep this zero on my, my pencil mark the whole time. And we're going to save that for later, just in case. Well, it's important to note, this is a primer, not a finished paint. It's not going to have good protection against the UV. It'll just make sure that while you're building, and the following couple of weeks after that, it's not going to get destroyed if you get rain. But it is very important to make sure you paint your finished product. Important to see that my, my finished floor is here. But I'm bringing the wallboard about a quarter inch away from the edge. And that's intentional. I don't want to have this wallboard coming in contact with the concrete. Remember, our protection from moisture wicking up is this lumber here. This stuff, I want to make sure I leave that air gap so I don't have direct contact. And all you really have to do here, guys, drive one of your nails. Okay, now because we're going to go, this is the back side, first of all, and we're going to get finished trims, you don't have to be exact about getting in here and use a nail punch. You can put these right through the thick part. Okay. Now you'll notice that these grooves are lined up with my nail heads. So these boards are designed that my, the groove of the board is lined up with everything at 16 inch, 16 inch on center. So I can actually go up and nail the middle of the board in as well, which is perfect. And I know that every second groove is going to have lumber there. Once you understand that building materials are designed to fit together, it's a lot more like Lego, but you got to use a hammer. It's not so intimidating, is it? What I would recommend is use your 16 inches as a rule. Every 16 inches across, you want to put in a nail, and every 16 inches going up as well. Now, one of the best ways that you can drive the the head of your nail in, take right. your screw, put it on the head of that nail, and just drive it like that. Use it like a nail punch. There's another tool you won't need to buy. In order to square your wall off, once you've done nailing the bottom, push this over and get this nice and flush with the outside of your wall. This one's you want, this is the outside corner, you want it nice and flush. Okay, remember, every second groove, there's gonna be wood there. Now I don't need to nail this outside edge because I'm going to be overlapping it and then I'll put the nail in the next piece. Let's get it cut and ready to go. Here's an interesting fact for you. All of the kits that are out there for building sheds, generally you're using the same board material. So don't fall for the, the idea that the kit is somehow giving you great value for your dollar. 
I think you're going to find that when you price this out, this particular way of doing things will actually be a little bit, uh, little bit cheaper than buying the kit. Okay. Now this is the same finishing board that the kits from the Home Depot and the Lowe's come with. Just to try to keep everything nice and square here. Now it's like the ship lap, right? It's the overlap. I'm going through both pieces of wood into the stud. So I'm using a bit of an angle just to make sure. The secret here is when you do paint, the head of all these nails is going to get covered and they'll all disappear in the paint job. And again, because we have the overlap, the materials are designed to build, go together, we know that there's going to be wood on the second groove. I'm using a two inch hot dip galvanized spiral nail. And the reason I'm using that is because it is an exterior nail. And I like to have a little bit of meat in the material that I'm attaching the wall to. You could go with something shorter if you like, but I like this one because of the size of the head. Now, the way that we're gonna measure the last board is from the outside coming in, okay? And remember, this groove has got this little detail. We know exactly the size. So it's coming in at 23 and three quarters. Should be exactly the same on the other side, if we're at all square. 23 and three quarters. Woo! I'm about a sixteenth off. Woo! Okay. <laughs> because we're finishing the outside corners with wood, we're going to take a little bit off on purpose. So we're going to go 23 and 5 eighths instead, just to make sure I got a nice fit and it's easier to put my brace on later. Now, remember, we have a 10 foot wall on the front of the building as well. And this is just a little bit less than 24 inches we're cutting off. Which means the other half of this, we're going to want to save for the front of the building. I want to measure from the lip of that detail. 23 and 5 eighths. And you see it's just next to my groove. So instead of marking a line, I'm just going to follow with my saw blade and cut that off. Important to note before you cut your next board, the front of this building is going to be a full eight feet. So we wanted to cut this off before we cut the height. <laughs> We're going to nail the bottom in. Then I'm going to nail the top on the other side. Make sure that my joint is closed here before I get too carried away. I am going to teach everybody here a little trick. How to lift up your wall by yourself and install your bracing without having it collapse on you. Basically, we're going to put one screw into here, not very tight, and it'll act kind of like a hinge. All right, so when I lift the wall up, this piece of wood will stay on the ground. I'll do another screw like a hinge on the other side. After I lift it up, I can grab this piece. It'll be hinged. I can lift it up, screw it into the wall, and it'll hold everything in place. So in order to do that, we want to just mark back half of the depth of the 2x4, which is 3 and a half, And that is 1 and 3 quarters. Okay, so 1 and 3 quarters there, 1 and 3 quarters here. That is exactly the midpoint of both of those boards. And if we throw one screw in that place, and this will hold it in the perfect position. Now watch, you lift, pull that back on the board a bit. When you unscrew, hold it open. Yeah. Now it's a hinge, okay? Do the same on the other end. Here's the crazy part. In order for this to work, I have to have this board like this, right? So you want to get an idea of where you want it to be, and then just drop it down, and then screw it, throw a screw in here too. 
nice and loose. Okay, now everything moves independently. Now we just lift the wall. Now watch the hinge part. See, nothing happens there. Okay, I'm gonna come over holding my wall now. And I am going to intentionally have the wall leaning in just a little bit. And I want that because I don't want it to have the propensity to fall the other direction right now. That would be bad. Okay, there we go. That's not going anywhere. Because we built the wall with the stock lumber, now I can put my second plate up after the fact, right? And I can actually screw it from underneath, but I should find a straight one. <laughs> Here we go. La, 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 la. Just remember, when you're getting materials delivered, they're intentionally not getting the best stuff in the pile. <laughs> and the reality is, I see guys there all day long checking every piece of lumber, going through that pile like somehow they deserve the best wood in the world. Listen, they're gonna get it home, they're gonna put it outside, it's gonna rain that night. It'll be just as twisted as everything else. Do yourself a favor and don't waste your time. As long as you know how to tie everything together. Crooked lumber, straight lumber, it's all the same thing. So here we go, that's a seven foot high shed on the back wall. Now listen, you don't need to have a six foot wall with an eight foot peak and back to a six foot wall again and make a really short entrance. We're gonna go seven here, eight feet out here. You're gonna have tons of space. You can have storage above your head when you're inside the shed. This is a great design because now every part of this wall is no taller than the height of that panel right out of the factory. This is important because if you make a gable wall with a peak, now you have to make your whole shed really low or you're gonna be buying extra pieces of that exterior board in order to cap the triangular gable on the top. So this is why this design works and it's real quick and simple. Now Max is gonna go grab me some lunch <laughs> and while he's gone, we'll throw it on time lapse and I'll just keep on building and we'll see you when he gets back. Now that I got that corner attached, I'm just bringing all this in line and using screws to tighten it all together. This is awesome because screws will actually pull things closed. So the way we're gonna finish the last wall is we're gonna build it in place on the ground. We're gonna just open up the walls more than 90 degrees by measuring off our 10 foot board. There we go. So let's just get a quick update here, what we're doing. This is our back wall. This is our seven foot cut double plate because that's gonna be the backside of our sloped roof. That'll transfer load onto these like I was talking about. The side walls are attached, screwed in the corners and opened up nice and wide so we can actually build our, our front wall inside this space. I attached the skin with an overhang on both sides so that when I put this wall up I can close this gap and nail it together okay and that'll leave my front face flush to this corner and that corner and then we'll put the trim boards on the reason these are cut full length is because a roof line goes something like this right <clears throat> on an angle and until we get the front wall built and we have that angle defined I don't want to try to cut that board it's easier to do after the fact Use a reciprocator, we can get that mark cut and then go at it from the inside. It'd be just fine to do that before we put the roof on. Uh, then we're gonna just add a little bit of stick framing inside that as well, okay? So let's not get ahead of ourselves. We're gonna build the front wall, it's a full eight feet. Our lumber that we bought was actual eight foot stick. If you have lumber available in your area and it's uh, uh, 82 and 5 eighths, then you can buy that plus the top and bottom plate gets you to 96. I'm sorry, 92 and 5 eighths, plus the top and bottom is 96. Um, 
that'll work out fine too. Then you're going to add the second top plate for the structural issue that I was talking about. And if there's a gap with the front skin and the top, it doesn't matter because we're going to be adding the 1x4 boards everywhere to cover up our gaps and to make it all look pretty. So you have lots of flexibility, which is why this design is perfect for the homeowner. Now, we're going to build the front wall. And the reason we stopped our, our production here to talk to you on camera is because we're going to do a door and two windows. Now, without getting into too much detail, there's a variety of different types of window you can buy for a shed. You can buy them so you have a regular case window and it has a nailing flange on it. And I think if you buy or have seen other videos, there's uh, windows that come with some of the shed kits. It has the nailing flange and it goes over top of this board and then you nail that nailing flange on and it looks ugly. Uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're actually getting a window. It's designed, it's called a shed window. It's at Home Depot. It's part of their stock lumber, stock uh, inventory. And it has a... Uh, uh, a window exterior window casing like a jam and it sits wider than the window so when you're looking at them uh, there's gonna be a measurement it'll say 15 by 39 okay is one of them the, it, the 15 measurement is actually the the width of the exterior of the window the casement part that's inside that goes between your 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 studs is actually um, I think I think it's uh, I think it's only a 12 so this window, you can cut into any stud bay and you can just, if you're not worried about your design or you're just looking to get a bit of daylight in there, you can just take any stud bay, trace out the 39 inches, cut it with the saw, drop the skin off and then stick that window in, all right, and throw a couple screws from the inside and you're done and you're good to go. What we're going to do though is because we're worried about the design features here, we're actually centering our door and then adding two windows. So instead of measuring left to right on this wall, we're actually going to start from the center going in both directions so that our stud bays are perfectly symmetrical with the door and then we don't have to get into too much creative framing and then it'll make it easier to nail the skin on afterwards. So we're going to go with this particular shed. We're going to use a, a traditional barn door style. So we're going to make a nice 32 inch opening with a 34 inch door. So what I want to do is first I want to take this measurement, let me just get this out of the way, and these are 10 foot pieces of lumber. This is stock, so we can just go mark our 5 foot as our center line. Yeah, that's a little rough and sloppy. Okay, we're going to get our square here. Okay, there's our center line. Now, 32 inch door, right? That's 16 inches. We put that on our center line, and we're going to mark there, and we're going to mark 32. Okay, and then we'll take our square and we'll translate that number across and we'll put the X, which is where the lumber will go. So that'll represent the finished hole. Because we're actually nailing on a, um, uh, a wood panel as a skin, we don't need to double up on the studs here because it's not a hinge. So we'll just go with one stud, okay? And then we're going to say this is the rest of our space. Now, we're going to measure 16 inches this way, all right? Now, if we go here and here, that would represent a window. That leaves me with 12 inches on the other side. But for me, the window is a little bit too far to the right. I would rather have a 12 inch gap here and a 16 over here. So I'll start there, measuring 16, okay? And then 32. And this will be my window, okay? That I think will look a lot better. We'll do the same on the other side. So outside coming in 16 and then 32. And then we'll mark the outside of that for the studs. And that'll be my window placement. So now you can see we have the center of our wall for our door framed to here. There'll be a section of wall and then our window. And because we measured from the outside on both sides, everything on this is going to be completely symmetrical. Again, sometimes you just got to stop and think, how is it going to finish? If you just go left to right the whole time, you'll have windows staggered off to the side and it'll look stupid. So sometimes when you're doing features like this, it's easier to measure from the middle going out. Anyway, because we're going to go with an eight foot wall, which is the size of our board, which is dictating our design, um, top plate, bottom plate, and the next plate, 
off an eight foot stick, I'm taking four inches off. That'll leave me a little bit extra gap and that's fine. Man, is it ever hot today? I'll tell you, we sure don't get that dry heat to get down in the south around here. Around here, it's always that kind of heat that just makes you sweat just by opening up your eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. It's over 100 degrees right now? Yeah. Holy crap. So I've got a 10-foot wall section here. And I have, uh, I have it set up where this wall is going to go into, uh, into this. So the skin, if it's flush there, comes to the corner here. Perfect, right? So what I'm doing is I am basically setting this up eyeball. So I'll put the two big pieces on. And then I'm going to try to line up the header of the door. <laughs> and see if I can arrange this somehow where everything is going to work out perfect. We'll see. Because I hate putting the skin all the way over the whole door and then cutting it all out. That's almost perfect. Wow. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this out on the, on the lawn. I'm going to nail this piece on to square off the wall. I'm going to use this as my measuring template and then line this up so that the lines are in the right spot. Then I'll nail this one down and then I'll cut this one to install in the gap. And then it'll be beautiful. Woo! We're going to just set this where it goes. Leave a little room there. We want to just get this where it's supposed to go and have these grooves lined up. Here we go. So when we got all this cut and installed, it's going to look really pretty. I'm going to cut this much here. I want to create the overlap effect. So I'm going to actually try to cut this back a little bit so that when I, when I break this off, I want to have a little bit of the under back side of this to go underneath this edge. So I didn't bury that nail. I'm going to try to Now I don't need a whole lot. Just a little bit. And you'll see what I mean. Just Enough to get that look. Bam. That'll be perfect. I got my mark here, so I'm gonna put my zero line on it. All right. I'm gonna place my finger beside the board. We're gonna do the rip, and I've pulled this about six inches off the edge of the board. I'm gonna put my zero on my mark, set the end down, and put my fingers. I'm gonna hold the plate. I'm gonna come back here, use my fingers as the guide. So let's put this panel in first. Time to get our last wall in place. That's not going to go anywhere. All right, here we go. One more screw, just so this thing doesn't fall down. I love how that pulls everything nice and tight together. Done. Okay, whew, it's been a busy day. 
a hot day, but we got our walls up. We're just going to have to uh, get this squared, get it attached to the concrete, and then tomorrow we'll worry about the roof because, like always, it looks like it's going to rain. <laughs> Typical when you order materials, we had enough. All right, the, the the dimensions here is it's seven and a half feet deep and it's ten feet across the front, and there was just enough of this material to finish this off. Except that panel over there is going to be a door, and I'd like to have it all in one piece instead of my leftovers, because it'll provide structural integrity for whatever framing I use for that door. So in hindsight, I should have left one of the panels on the back wall off and then I could have scabbed on the leftover pieces since it's not visible anyway. Because the front, I've had it in the back of my head, I'll just use the leftovers on the front. But because we measured from the center to get all the symmetry perfect, I didn't want to have these lines messed up. And so that's left me in this predicament. So just advice for yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to have all the skin on before you put the wall up, but if you're going to be doing this exact design, Keep at least one sheet off the back wall for the door area and then you can use your pieces on your back wall. Just a little tip for you. <laughs> so yours can be better than mine. <laughs> Alright, so now you can start to see this taking shape. Eight feet on the front, seven on the back. This will represent our roof structure. We're going to go with 10 foot 2x4s on a 12 inch center. That will transfer more than enough load back to each of these walls. And then we'll be able to cap all that in the in some pressure treated sienna brown wood so it'll have a finished wood exterior framing that whole roof line it'll be really cool but you get an idea we're gonna have a little bit of cutoff here all right and then where it's shy it doesn't matter because we're gonna be framing in like a picture frame new england style one by four trims and that's gonna be amazing so all in all you can start to see how this design is gonna work out we're gonna have the roof extend about four inches on this side and almost two feet on the other side, so we have an outdoor covered area. You can put things outside, you know, storage, firewood, that sort of thing. Yeah, really liking the way this is coming together. Very versatile, very quick, very cheap. Okay, so the last part of our framing of the shed is actually to square it off and then get it attached to the concrete. And this is very important. Um, there are a lot of areas around a world where it gets quite windy and so you don't want to just set your shed in the background or put it on a floating floor I mean if you want to put it on a floating deck that's fine but check your building codes and make sure it's allowed uh, we're actually going to be attaching it to the concrete pour just as an added protection so that we don't have damage from wind and really it's not that hard to do since we squared off the pad we just put these in here right try in both directions Make sure it's at least a nice, decent, regularly snug fit. I checked all the corners already, did a couple of wiggles. Now we're ready to go. And so we're going to go through a couple of options here that we have. One, of course, it's the same system we use in basements. In a lot of cases, both of these options are available. One of them is just a hammer drill and tap on screws. And the bit comes in the package with the Phillips screw. Just remember, the reason we build our walls with the plates fully intact, even though we have door areas, is because after we've attached everything to the ground, then we'll cut out the plates. This helps to make sure that everything is level and plumb and square before we cut holes for our doors, so the doors install quite easily. So don't go doing that rookie mistake and drilling in where the door is going to be. <laughs> go to the stud just next to the edge of the door, and then we can drill it in. Now, this DeWalt is amazing it has an impact hammer drill on it and at high speed and I just set this right in there so it makes a bit of noise so don't be afraid to use your mirror protection here now you'll notice the best way to use Tapcon is apply pressure and go all the way in until it's completely buried you want the hole as deep as your screw. Very important. And if you start cleaning it out as you go, you'll actually make the hole too big because this is all vibrating down there and the tip here is just going to make a mess of the hole. You want to have to force that screw in there. If you're not forcing your screw in, it's not really grabbing and it's not going to do the job you want it to do. 
The other option is a little bit more fun for all you gun enthusiasts out there. It's a 22 caliber explosive hammer. I like using the number fours. It's because they make a nice big bang. <laughs> Uh, being from Canada, we don't get to use too many explosives and that sort of thing, so it's kind of fun for us to get an excuse to use our hammer. Now, this one's the trigger. Not the old-fashioned one you had to hit with a hammer and you always broke your wrist with it. Make sure before you put the nail in, there's nothing, no explosive charge in the chamber. You just put that in there up to the orange. Why am I holding a nail? Put your little bullet in there, all right? And then before you go getting crazy, this one you definitely want to use here in protection. It's loud. This is the first time I've had a chance to use this new toy with the trigger. I've always had a semi-automatic or the single shot. So the directions say just to press it down, push it as far as you can go, then pull the trigger. Woohoo! Well, that was easy. I wonder how loud it is without the ear protection. Oh, that's pretty loud. I think I'm gonna wear the ear protection. I love this new trigger. I mean, it only takes about, I don't know, maybe 15 pounds, 20 pounds of pressure to get down to the end of that. And I mean, that nail was buried in there really good. Gotta love my job. Fire in the hole. I love my job. All right. Well, that concludes everything to deal with building the walls. Next time we come, we'll focus on building our roof system. Now, this is awesome. No shingles necessary. No sheet metal. You're going to love it. So thanks for joining us on our little video today of how to build some walls. It's important to know how to frame. Good framing comes with a good design and understanding how everything fits together. So if you have a nice, simple design like this, framing is easy. Hopefully you've learned that and you feel more confident with your framing projects. And if you have any questions about framing, then by all means, ask them in the comments section below. I answer the questions. I'm here to help. So I look forward to seeing you there. Don't forget to check out our Instagram account. We're going to see you again soon.